Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Luke Rexing, and I'm the Vice President of the Minnesota Republic. And on behalf of the Students for a Conservative Voice, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy lives to attend our event tonight. If today is the first time that you're hearing of the, uh, the Students for a Conservative Voice or the Minnesota Republic, we want young conservatives and those who deviate from the majority to feel welcome. SCV fights for free and equal speech to add to the marketplace of ideas on the UMN campus and helps our members access new skill sets, opportunities, and resources. The Minnesota Republic newspaper is a project of the Students for a Conservative Voice, and you can read it at mnrepublic.com. Sadly, we have been reporting on anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota since the Minnesota Republic's inception nearly two decades ago. Before COVID, there were at least half a dozen conservative groups on campus, but today, Students for a Conservative Voice is the last one. SCV is a student group that loves doing events like this, but they can be expensive. So you have probably noticed that there was an envelope on all of your seats here today, and they are empty, but they should not be. <laughs> um, I, I just please ask that you, you donate whatever you can, and it, and it will go towards keeping the last conservative group on campus alive. Um, so any amount is greatly appreciated. But since the attack on Israel on October 7th, anti-Semitic sentiment has increased worldwide, but especially on college campuses. I remember last semester I was walking past Kaufman Memorial Union and it was vandalized. On the side it was spray painted Free Palestine and the criminals um, had other anti-Semitic graffiti posted all over the side of, of Kaufman. So to set some of the context for this evening's discussion, let me read to you a few passages from an official College of Liberal Arts website. We mourn for the many lives lost. We stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and with Palestinian scholars and organizers. At a time when so many institutions are renewing a commitment to Israel's right to self-defense, we assert that Israel's response is not self-defense, but the continuation of a genocidal war against Gaza and against Palestinian freedom, self-determination, and life. As members of a land-grab university that resides on the unceded land Mini Sota Makose of the Dakota people, we are painfully aware of our complicity with the settler colonial violence against indigenous people and continuing the dispossession of their land on Turtle Island. We are equally complicit with the global imperialism that engenders the maiming and killing of the Palestinian people by the US-backed Israeli state. We insist on our ethical and political responsibility to raise our voices against settler colonialism and the US government's enabling military and monetary support of the apartheid state of Israel. As scholars and solidarity workers who seek justice everywhere, we respond to the call of Palestinian feminists and the Palestinian freedom fighters for the transnational solidarity and assert that Palestine is a feminist issue. None of us will be free unless the Palestinian people are free and Palestinian land is liberated. I can't imagine being a Jewish student on campus and feeling this type of hostility. So this is what we have gathered here tonight to discuss. Um, and afterwards, there will be some time for a Q&A, so please try to think of some questions along the way. But with that, I will introduce our speakers tonight. We have James Dickey, and James is a constitutional lawyer at the Upper Midwest Law Center. To his left is Richard Painter. Richard is a professor here at the law school, and he formerly served from 2005 to 2007 as the chief White House ethics lawyer in the George W. Bush administration. And to his left, we have Marion Rarick, and she is a nonprofit executive director and Republican state representative from Maple Lake, Minnesota here. And finally, last but not least, we have Michael Sue. And Michael is a business development professional and was on the Board of Regents here at the U of M for six years. And he is also an alumnus of the Alpha Sigma chapter of the Sigma Chi fraternity here. And I'm very pleased to see that there are several of us six here to enjoy the event tonight. So we are very excited to have them here today to discuss anti-Semitism on campus 
And after another reminder to please donate to our cause, I will hand it off to James to take it away. Thank you for that, Luke. Really appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm James Dickey from the Upper Midwest Law Center. Um, really appreciate the work that Luke and the folks uh, with Students for a Conservative Voice and the Minnesota Republic have put into this event. Uh, I appreciate the, all of you who have come out here tonight, and uh, we're also live streaming on Facebook Live, so for those out in the audience, thank you for tuning in as well. Uh, we're here tonight, as Luke noted, to talk about a culture of anti-Semitism that is being created by faculty on this campus, along with other concerning issues that the administration and the legislature should take action to address. But first, I'm going to provide a little bit more background. You heard some of what Luke talked about uh, uh, for why Professor Painter, here to my left, and, and Reg Regent Sue filed a complaint with the Federal Department of Education last December. And then we'll begin the conversation portion of the program. After Hamas terrorists brutally murdered more than 1,200 Israeli citizens and took hundreds more hostage on October 7, 2023, and Israeli forces responded to those brutal attacks intending to dismantle the Hamas war machine, several departments of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota issued statements using their university websites condemning Israel and appearing to justify Hamas's terrorist acts. These were the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies on October 16th, the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature on October 20th, and the Department of American Indian and Indigenous Studies on December 28th. The Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies Department said on their website, and still is on their website, for example, that, quote, Israel's response is not self-defense, but the continuation of a genocidal war against Gaza and against Palestinian freedom, self-determination, and life, and reaffirming its, sub quote, support for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The department also called on students, colleagues, and friends around the country to call for lifting the siege, ending the occupation, and dismantling Israel's apartheid system. Cultural studies, for its part, said that Israel had used the attacks as an excuse to redouble the brutality already visited upon ordinary Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, and the occupied territories. The Israeli state's ongoing oppression of the Palestinian people must end. It called Israel's actions genocidal as well. The American Indian Studies Department on its website justified Hamas's actions as a, quote, right of return and described Israel's actions as a, quote, genocidal expression of its right to exist. These statements attempted to disclaim that they were only the views of the professors signing them, but they used university property and the maroon and gold to host their viewpoint, something others in the university without the levers of power cannot do. These professors are free to hold these views and even share them. But by appropriating the university's colors and website to disseminate them, these professors have clouded the university culture, especially in the College of Liberal Arts, with the power of anti-Semitism. Statements like these have become a flashpoint across the nation, and they are representative of a university culture of anti-Semitism. And because of statements like these by leaders at this university, Professor Painter and Regent Sue asked President Edinger and the provost in a November 17, 2023 letter to stop the use of university property to spout these anti-Semitic viewpoints. As they put in that letter, quote, in sum, six days after 1,200 Israeli citizens were murdered in cold blood by terrorists and hundreds taken hostage, GWSS issued a statement condemning Israel, the victim of the terrorist attack, but not condemning Hamas, the perpetrator of the attack. And after getting no response from the administration to address these atrocious statements, Professor Painter and Mr. Sue then filed a formal complaint with the U.S. Department of Education, asking for an investigation into their concerns about anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota. In the complaint, Professor Painter and former Regent Sue noted that these statements are openly anti-Semitic. The call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions has, for example, been so-called by the Anti-Defamation League. And they asked the Department of Education to put a stop to what they call the intimidation, emotional distress, and harm to Jewish students from the anti-Semitic departmental faculty statements on Israel, while still calling for academic freedom in non-university non forums. So with that, let's start with the elephant in the room. On December 12, 2023, Professor Painter, you, and Regent Sue asked the U.S. Department of Education to investigate these concerns at the University of Minnesota. And thereafter, on January 16, 2024, the department did, in fact, initiate an investigation which was front page news in the Star Tribune. 
So Professor Painter and Regent Sue, can you talk about what led to the filing of that complaint and what you are asking the university to do? And whoever wants to lead off, go ahead. Well, this complaint is about uh, principally the websites, although this fits into a culture of anti-Semitism uh, at this university and many other universities around the country that goes well beyond these particular websites. But we've asked the Department of Education to focus first on these websites. And the concept is very simple, and I used to talk about this when I was in the White House, about the difference between official capacity and personal capacity. A United States government employee cannot, in their official capacity, advocate for a political party. The same thing here at the University of Minnesota. I cannot advocate for the Republican Party or for the Democratic Party. I can't put a, a DFL or a, a Republican uh, big signs in the window of my office and, and use that as a campaign stop. Okay. Bottom line is, if you are a professor here in your own front yard, you can have a DFL yard sign, a Republican yard sign, and if you want a Hamas yard sign, that's just fine. But don't bring it here onto websites, official websites paid for by the Minnesota taxpayer that our students have to consult in order to find out what the requirements are for graduation in a major, what the course availability is, contact information for professors. The Gender and Women's Studies Department, the Cultural Studies Department, the American Indian Studies Department have sent a, sent a very clear message. No Jews are welcome here, unless you are one of the few who is willing to say that the state of Israel has no right to exist. And this is not about uh, whether Israel is responding in an appropriate manner or not, and all the different debates we could have about what's going on in Gaza, just as we had debates after 9-11 here in the United States. But imagine if after 9-11, someone had taken a university website and said that Osama bin Laden was a hero and that America had no right to exist. And that's what these professors are doing with your taxpayer dollars. And we have created an environment uh, that is unacceptable and intimidating for Jewish students. It's a violation of Title VI, and therefore we've asked the Department of Education to investigate. Thanks, Richard, <clears throat> and, and thanks for having me here tonight. I, I would just add to that and say that, in my view, I was disappointed when the university declined to do anything, even, I think, even respond to us. Uh, and uh, I said, to uh, the chair, of the current chair of the board, that there is plenty uh, in the region's code of conduct that they could use to resolve these issues. And you know, if if you want want to find that uh, policy, go and look at regents.umn.edu and read the code of conduct. And you can see that this kind of behavior should not be allowed on our campus, and that the university administration should do something about it. The fact that they haven't means that they've now joined about 100 other schools uh, of higher education, more um, K-12 schools, but over 100 schools of higher education in being looked at in uh, a Department of uh, Education Office of Civil Rights investigation. So we are pleased that the, um, the government is looking at it, the Department of Education specifically, and uh, you know, it's a it's a third party kind of thing now, which is I think what the regents and the university administration wanted. They want someone on the outside to look at this situation because they're just afraid to handle it internally, even using the tools that have been in place on the code of conduct. I think the current code of conduct, if you look at it, uh, was put in place in 2006, and this university has had lots of problems with anti-Semitism, specifically. And this is the first time that the Department of, Department of Education that I know of uh, is involved in, in looking at what's going on. Yeah, thank you for that, Regent Sue. And are you all aware of any other situations like this in which uh, a department at the university has taken their website and made a statement like this uh, of, of any kind? Well, I, we're aware of one case at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, apparently had the same kind of issue. And that university, or at least the chancellor at that university, who incidentally used to be here, actually has taken down that, um, that speech from uh, a university website. And they're, not, they're no longer on the list of schools uh, listed at the Department of Education website. 
So they've handled it internally, which is what I hope the, that our university did, but they haven't. So now it's really you know, up to the government to handle. Yeah, I will say that two years ago, we did have some faculty statements, um, I believe on websites uh, advocating for BDS. And I wrote a memorandum to the provost, to the then president, uh, Joan Gable, one of the many reasons she is the former president. Uh, Joan uh, completely ignored me. She would never answer anything that I ever sent her. Uh, and, uh, and the provost never got back, but it was the same issue about websites and official statements. And I said, you know, if you want to advocate for BDS and you want to boycott Israel, or maybe I'd prefer to boycott, uh, you know, China or, uh, or Iran, uh, you know, okay, but, you know, let's not have that on the web pages. That, that's, uh, that is creating an educational obstacle for our Jewish students. It, we, it, that was just ignored. And I still have that memo from two years ago. So we knew this issue was there. Uh, the university knew it was there. But of course, they didn't want to do anything because they don't want to stand up to the faculty. That is how you get the million dollar job, a year job as a university president. You don't stand up to the extremists and the faculty. And that's what we're going to get out of our next president. That's what it's looking like. Someone who won't stand up for what's right. I mean, this, this BDS movement that you just mentioned, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, I mean, this really is an attempt, and this is why the Anti-Defamation League has, has made it, in, in their view, that it, is, it can be used in an anti-Semitic way. It is an attempt to say that Israel doesn't actually have a right to exist and that no one else should recognize Israel. So this is a big deal you're talking about, that that has been on the university website for a long time and has persisted. And so, Representative Rare, can we turn to you? On February 2nd, of this year, after the Department of Education opened up its investigation into the university, you and a couple dozen other sitting Minnesota legislators wrote a letter to President Ettinger about the behavior that Professor Painter and Mr. Sue have just described. You note in the letter that faculty members have every right to say and believe what they want, but they sh that they should not use university platforms to amplify their speech. Can you talk about what you've observed that prompted that letter and what, if anything, the university has said in response to it? Yeah, thank you. So um, I am the lead of the higher ed committee, uh, and uh, I have to thank a couple people. So my husband is here. who's the He's on the higher ed committee of the Senate. And uh, even though I'm married to a senator, uh, this happened so quickly that I didn't even toss it to him to say, do any senators want to sign on to? Um, but we just, we were really trying to um, encourage President Enninger to take it down. It was so inflammatory. It was so one-sided. And, and I would even go so far to say, even though I, we didn't say this in our letter, um, factually inaccurate, which is, uh, that is how... Um, things escalate when you when you phrase things in such a way that is inflammatory, unnecessarily inflammatory. Inflammatory um, that gets attention of the legislature. I will also say that at the legislature, we fully recognize that we have very little power over the U University of Minnesota. I fully recognize that they existed before statehood, that they have autonomy, uh, and so. The only lever that we have, which has been a, a conversation multiple times in the recent years, is the purse. So you have to understand that the legislature, the taxpayers, allocate and pay $1.4 billion to this university. And that is just general fund money. That is not grant money that comes in through the students. That is not the extra $100 million that comes in all kinds of research projects and all kinds of other things. That is purely O&M, Operation and Maintenance General Fund, $1.4 billion of the taxpayer money. And again, if I add it all up, it'd probably be closer to two. And they have a $4 billion annual. Now, that's a two-year budget. So I fully recognize that the legislature does not have power and authority over, but we do have the purse string. So in that letter, we asked him to take it down. I had 26 members of the Minnesota House of Representatives, 26. That's a lot. And we got it done in two days. So, um, and I believe it was even on a Friday uh, <laughs> that we sent it out because it was just, it was so quick. Um, there are members of the House of Representatives that are incredibly passionate about truth and about protecting Israel. And many would say, if you bless Israel, God will bless you. That is what is spoken many, many times. So 
this direct assault and continuation of the attack of Israel, its statehood, its, its ability to exist, was incredibly heartbreaking to us. So, it, and I know I would have had more because after the letter went out, I had several others that said, oh, I didn't see it till now and I would have signed on. So I probably would have had easily 30 members of the Minnesota House of Representatives. And to put that in perspective, that is a lot of members. There is 134 total members of the Minnesota House. There are 67 members of the Senate. That is a lot of members. That is a very loud voice. And we closed the letter, not only asking it to be taken down, but we closed the letter saying, we will, your response to us, we will take into consideration when you come and ask us for more money. And what happened just this week <laughs> in the Senate just today is the University of Minnesota came to the Senate and asked for $500 million of additional bonding. Now, we probably will only do a $1 billion bonding bill, so that's half of the entire potential bonding bill, half. So they had, not only did they say, no, we're not taking this down. No, we don't care what you have to say. Then they had, I'll say the word, audacity to come back to the legislature and ask for a half a billion dollars and an additional supplemental budget ask of $45 million. Like it was nothing, like, like this, this attack on the integrity of the country itself of Israel was acceptable. That's, that is what happened. Thank you for asking me here today. And, um, and I do want to just acknowledge, too, in the back of the room, we have Regent Farnsworth, who was kind enough to attend. And I'm telling you, if you've got any regent here at the University of Minnesota that comes to all kinds of things, and, and, and this regent did, too, when he was there, but uh, he did. And so I'm so happy that he's here to hear these comments, too. And I know he was both in the higher ed committee uh, of the House and the Senate. Um, so. There, there is some hope back there. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. And thank you, Regent, for being here. Um, and, you know, uh, one thing you mentioned just, just now in this conversation was the bonding bill, that a lot of this big ask is through bonding. Now, you know, many people in this room are probably familiar that the, the legislature is currently made up, controlled by one party in both the House and Senate and the governor's mansion, also controlled by the same party. But as I understand it, and maybe you can comment on this, Representative Rarick, it's not the case that a simple majority can carry a bonding bill. So can you comment on why that's an important thing in terms of what the university is asking the legislature to do? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So a bonding bill takes a super majority. So in the House Representatives, the, the ruling party, the Democrats, have a four-seat majority. They do not have the votes to pass a bonding bill. In the Senate, also supermajority, they have a one vote margin in the Senate. So there is no way that any bonding bill will move forward or be passed into law unless Republicans support it. Right. So, I mean, that, that, uh, the point being that, you know, when you said you have, you know, 26 other rep total representatives on there, even if it were the case that those were all Republican representatives on that, on that, uh, signing off on that, you'd still have, that still creates a problem for the university if they're not taking the words in that letter seriously. It absolutely does. And, and like I said, there are many more that would have signed on that letter. It was, we turned that around in about a day and a half. And uh, in legislative time, that's very quick. <laughs> um, and so I know that I would have had a lot more. And I've heard from a lot of other people that they stand with Israel, that they, um, uh, they don't want that statement on a taxpayer-funded website, that we literally fund 1.4 billion in general funds, and then another 100 million uh, in other projects, um, and then of course all the grant money, state grant money that comes in through the students. So it's it's a tremendous amount of money. Uh, give you also some context here that just recently the University of California at Berkeley has kind of made itself the poster child for what can happen as a result of this kind of behavior. 
the, the Brandeis Center uh, just sued UC Berkeley because the law school has been going even further than what the university here is providing on its websites, uh, allowing student groups to allegedly require Jewish students to take anti-Zionist oaths and support the BDS movement. And you know, to bring that home again, the University of Minnesota's own GWSS department specifically calls on the university to join the anti-Semitic BDS movement in its post-October 7th statement, which is still available online. And so let me, let me follow up with some of the conversation already here uh, to Professor Painter and Regent Sue. It, you know, it sure looks to me as someone who, despite me sitting next to you here, is on the outside. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an alum of the university, 2012, but uh, uh, for law school. But, you know, it, it sure strikes me that you're trying to, with your letter, with your complaint, really trying to help the university avoid the Berkeley pitfall that I just mentioned. And so along with standing beside its Jewish students and faculty, any further comment on that and your intent behind this particular complaint? Well, <clears throat> my, my internal kind of work for six years as a regent, I only had one vote and it didn't count for much. I was voted down almost every time. And uh, you know, I, I'm actually um, enjoying being on the outside because I don't have to go to all the meetings and all the stuff. And I just have to worry about kind of some of the things that make the news. And uh, I'm, I appreciate, you know, Richard Painter for bringing this issue to me. I wasn't really paying attention at the time. I was kind of in the back of my mind wondering, oh, I wonder what's going on at the university. How are they handling this type of thing? But it wasn't until uh, I got a call from Richard that he filled me in on exactly what was happening. And I felt that the university should use its uh, ability, capabilities uh, to actually make something happen here that is the right thing to do. Unfortunately, as I found through so much of my region service, that's just not a possibility. And I don't, I don't exactly know why, I just know it is. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you when I find out <laughs> or when I figured it out. Fair enough. Just say that we all know that there have been thousands of years of anti-Semitism and it comes in waves. Uh, many American uh, Jews are here because uh, there was a wave of anti-Semitism in Tsarist Russia in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, we all know, of course, about the wave of anti-Semitism uh, that ended with the Holocaust. Uh, but uh, this has been history for thousands of years, uh, going back to the expulsion of the Jews from Israel itself. Uh, in the diaspora uh, by the Romans, and then the Spanish who expelled the Jews, and just about every European country expelled the Jews at one point or another. We went through a wave of anti-Semitism in the 1920s, uh, when Henry Ford was running the Dearborn Independent newspaper and running cartoons that looked like uh, what came in uh, the Der Sturmer. And by the way, there's a cartoonist employed by the University of Pennsylvania right now, who they will not fire, who has cartoons that are just as bad as anything you saw in Der Sturmer or in uh, the most anti-Semitic, uh, hateful, uh, absolutely hateful. We are in another wave of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's global. Uh, we have money coming into many universities in the United States from Qatar. Now, we're going to find out if any of that's coming to the University of Minnesota. I know it's going in the Ivy League, big time. Uh, and I know it's going to some of those University of California schools, big time. But there's a lot of Middle Eastern money driving this and funding these organizations, faculty members taking money uh, from various uh, special interests that are funded from the Middle East. Uh, but this is a very, very serious situation. Uh, and our university is starting to look like what was happening to German universities in the 1920s and 30s with the polarization between the extreme left. We don't really have a, a conservative voice in the, in the universities, but what happened to German universities, the extreme left and the extreme right battling in the streets and battling the universities. Uh, and the one thing they could agree on is they hated Jewish people. You know, there's anything to unite a country, they used to destroy the Jews. I mean, this happened before. Are we going to let it happen again? And that's what these people want in this university, and I'm not going to stand for it. The Gender and Women's Studies Department, the Cultural Studies Department, American Indian Studies, they should be ashamed of themselves, and their funding should be cut off by the legislature. Thank you for that, Professor. And with that, I, I, I hesitate to leave the topic, but uh, I... I I want to move on to a couple other topics that I know that there are some spe specific expertise on this panel here as well today. Um, administrative bloat 
and rising tuition costs. Well, there's already a strong reaction there. Not, not that you haven't had any other strong reactions tonight, Professor. Um, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, from 1990 through 2019, the price of a four-year degree in United States universities doubled, even accounting for inflation. And according to a report from U.S. News & World Report from 2015 through 2020, instructional spending, money on faculty, at four-year public universities was unchanged, while spending on institutional support rose by 7%. And I'll leave this open to any panelist who wants to take it first. What's going on with bureaucracy and bloat at the U, and what can be done to address it? I'll, you, you I'll go first. <laughs> <clears throat> I fought this for six years uh, when I was you know, starting in 2015. I, I, as part of my uh, election campaign, I took around a chart, uh, one chart with me, and that chart showed the uh, tuition at the University of Minnesota from 1960 to the present time, 2014 or 2015. And uh, you can imagine what it looked like. It started at $300 a year in 1960. OK, so now uh, I think at the time it was around $12,500 $12, in 2015. And I fought every day of my region service to keep that down. And actually, uh, one of the ways that I got involved in this whole concept of the culture of noncompliance is I told President Kaler in one of our first one-on-one -on -one meetings, I said, hey, we've got to figure out a way to hold tuition down to zero. And I think if we do that, we will get more money from the legislature because they'll actually see that we're actually trying to do something. And he said, well, go find $7 million and seven votes. And I left, and I went looking for the $7 million, and I said, hey, I think I just read a memo about um, some legal settlement for like 10 or $15 million. And I said, so I wrote an email to the board office, and I said, where did this money go? And it was there that I started unraveling what they were doing, which is uh, money from lawsuits, for example, are supposed to go to what we call um, a reserve. Um, I forgot what it's called now, but it's Special Reserves Fund, uh, Central Reserves Fund. And that money, uh, that policy was actually put in place back in the late 1980s when I was a student here. And I remember the scandal that caused the legislature, uh, or not the legislature, but the legislature asked questions. The president's house was being remodeled at the time, as it is now, and they put a $100,000 fence around it and spent a lot of money making it into basically a convention center. Uh, with a new uh, catering kitchen and all that stuff. And then the president, this is President Keller at the time, spent, you know, I think uh, $15,000 on a desk for his office and a credenza. And this became a big problem. And then the questions were, OK, where's this money coming from? And the university kind of had to explain whether they had a slush fund, because a lot of these funds were not approved through the Board of Regents, who were supposed to approve a lot of these funds. And so they, as part of the result of this whole scandal, they created the Central Reserves Fund. The Central Reserves Fund is supposed to take in all non-budgeted revenue that's supposed to, that comes in, like through a settlement of a lawsuit, for example. So in this case, $10 million or so dollars came in. And I said, well, why isn't it in the Central Reserves Fund? And they said, oh, well, we bypassed the Central Reserves Fund. And I said, oh, you did? Well, do you understand that there's a policy that says it's supposed to go into the Central Reserves Fund? And then you're supposed to ask the Board of Regents to move the money. And they said, well, we just didn't see the need to do that. We, we bypassed it. So I actually held up the closing of the university's books for that year, in, that was 2015 until they actually, it was kind of an agreement where they had to then go through an approval process to, to bring it into central reserves and then take it out. So I didn't actually win the battle on the money. I just won the battle on the process. And then ever since then, I think they've been pretty good about putting the money in the right place and then asking the regents to move the money to another account. So that, that was my kind of first move into the Central Reserve's uh, you know, kind of noncompliance related to that. And I think it was a, a battle that was worth fighting at the time because you know, when I was actually going through the legislature and my election process, I was often told, we give the university this money, but they never spend it on what they say they're going to spend it on. 
and of course, day one, when you show up at the university, they say, oh, we're autonomous. Don't worry about that. They give us the money and we spend it how we want to. And unfortunately, that's what gets us in trouble. And that's why the legislature sometimes has to, you know, battle back and say, hey, do you really need this money? And uh, it's, it's been a, it was a learning process at the Board of Regents. I've got a lot of other battles that I'd love to talk about if we get time, but we may not have time. I understand that. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? I, I'm going to facts and figures in front of you. Right? <laughs> so I, I, I kind of want to defer to that. I'm a, I'm a data driven person. So back in 2015, former regent, uh, I was the vice chair of higher education. And um, I, I have to tell a quick little story. So this gentleman came out to my district to Maple Lake, sat in a coffee shop with me for three hours as I grilled him endlessly. And at the end of three hours, I'm like, OK, I will support you. Not only did I support him, but I helped kind of usher you across the finish line and, and use my uh, influence to, to get you elected. And you did exactly as we had hoped, which is dig down, get answers, uh, follow the law, right? Follow your own policies, uh, ask hard questions. So in my 12 years at the legislature, the bloat of the University of Minnesota has been continuous. It, it, it has never not been a, an issue. Um, and I'll, you know, I was looking at some of the, the statistics about students versus all of the employees of the university. And today we have eight or 68,000, about 400 students. So about 68,000 students. We have 27,675 employees. So let me, for those students in the room, let me just explain to you what that means. That means it takes two and a half of you students to pay for one employee of this university. Let that sink in for a second. So two and a half people paying your tuition is paying for one staff member employee of this university. Now, we have a presidential search and there are some president or uh, uh, hopefuls that come from universities that are worse than that. But that's a pretty heavy lift. So if you look at someone who's next to you and then a friend that's not in the room, that's an awful lot to ask of two and a half students. Now, the other thing I would say is that when I look at from their, the university's own website, and I looked at from 2016 until 2000, the fall of 2023, and there's a lot of categories you know, they have faculty, professional, administrative, civil service, labor, grad assistant, and professional and training. Now, if I was a student here, what I would hope is that we would have a lot of professors, because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to learn. And like I had said, there's 27,675 employees. Anyone want to venture a guess as to how many of those are actually faculty? So tw over tw almost 28,000 employees back in the corner there. About Boy, you, that would be amazing if the university had 7,000. That would be fabulous. But you know what they actually have? 4,823. That's how many faculty they have. Now, uh, and that's, that's sad because I think that it should be maybe a few more faculty, a few less administrative. And I don't know what all those other categories even mean. Maybe you do, because you were, and we've got a regent back there, maybe he knows. But here's, here's the fact of the matter. So the other category I found quite interesting were the grad assistants. So those that are teaching a lot of the classes, right? There are 4,404 grad assistants. So who do you think is doing an awful lot of teaching? Um, and I know this because my son-in-law graduated from here not too long ago with a biomath degree when he can't get a job. But anyway, that's another uh, thing for another day. Um, he can't get a job. 150 applications can't get a job. Because networking is very difficult through this university. You would think that there would be a great network. There is not. Um, anyway, so the bloat. The bloat has been there for as long as I've been in the legislature, there are not nearly as many professors as you would hope. You have an awful lot of other folks that are here. I don't know how necessary they are because I just have high level data. And when we ask questions like that at the legislature, we get very long answers 
um, that may or may not be helpful. <laughs> well, um, all I can remember is when I was a kid, uh, choosing colleges, uh, I knew that if I went to the State University, I grew up in Illinois, it would be uh, $500 a semester. Uh, my parents had the money to send me to a private school. It wasn't any better. Uh, but the bottom line is $500 a semester. I mean, it, was, it wasn't that different than the University of Minnesota. Uh, you know, we have had a situation where in real dollars, the tuition is three or four times what it was in 1980. Uh, what's going on? Is the education three or four times better than in 1980? No. It's good. Um, we got a little bit more critical theory and pro-Hamas theory and all that thrown in, but uh, I would say it's three or four times better than it was in 1980. What's going on? It's administrative bloat, uh, and it's massive salaries at the top, along with hiring huge numbers of people. Uh, let's look at the top. Uh, I read a story a couple of years ago in the uh, Grand Forks Herald about how Brunix, the president, he got himself a really nice retirement gig over at the Humphrey School for making $350,000 a year after he left the presidency of the University of Minnesota. And his former dissertation advisor, Laura Bloomberg, was over there running a program. And he comes on over there at three fifty dollars for I don't know what he did for three fifty. dollars That was a way of a lot of money back then. We're not talking about a president of the university. We're talking about a retired president of the university. Uh, and this is how this happens. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And that's the way these universities have been run around the country. It's not just the Minnesota problem. It's nationwide. Of course, we've got to compete with the Ivy League. So, oh, let's look at the University of Pennsylvania. $4 million a year for university president. Enough money. She raised $70 million from China that she forgot about conveniently in her confirmation hearing to be the ambassador of Germany. Why did she get to be the ambassador of Germany? Well, she set up a special center called the Penn Biden Center. Well, and gave Professor Joe an appointment. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. They just play with much more money out east than the Ivy Lake. Uh, but it's the same thing going on here, uh, where the university president got a pay raise. And what happens? They get the Board of Regents to work a deal for one of the regents to become the acting chancellor of the campus in Duluth. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And that's why it costs so much money to come here. It's not a better education. It's just people are taking your tuition dollars and the taxpayer money and putting it in their pocket. Can, can, can I, you, you mentioned Laura Bloomberg. Laura Bloomberg is one of the hopefuls. I think she's a finalist right now for the presidency of the university. She has the skill set. Oh boy. So let me just add one quick thing, too. Yeah, so, so that is correct. She is. And, but she comes from Cleveland State. So uh, that is a state college. It's not a public university. Uh, it's a very small school. Um, and uh, in my humble opinion, she is not qualified to actually run a very large university with 68,000 students. But that aside, so what I was going to say really quickly was... Um, the legislature actually uh, had a historic high. We had $650 million that we added to the higher ed realm, which is it was $4.1 billion in the biennium in total for higher education. Uh, and the University of Minnesota, out of that $650 million, received $125 million, which was an 8.3% increase. And they still raised, raised tuition by 3.5%. So they got literally historic amount of funding from the legislature, and they still raised tuition by 3.5%. You can't make it up. And at some point, it seems like it's got to stop. I mean, inflation is one thing, but these kinds of raises and hikes internally, like you're talking about Professor Painter, like you just mentioned, Representative Rarick, it just seems like it's uh, out of control uh, to, a to a large degree. And, and back to the legislature's funding of the uh, university system, so these increases, obviously, you've, you've taken note of, of these increases uh, on, on tuition, on the students here, who many of them are here, who are paying that and, and, and dealing with that, and not just the cost now, but the cost of what financing that education looks like. Um, you know, how much do, do these increases that you're seeing in tuition, on top of these massive payouts for administrators, 
Um, what kind of impact does it have on the legislators as you consider how much funding to appropriate to the U when funding bills come up? Well, I mean, it does, it's not seen very favorably, and especially when in mid-contract, so the, the previous president who left abruptly, uh, who shall not be named, um, she promised to stay if she got her $1.2 million contract, which she got, and then she abruptly left. Uh, the legislature did not like that too much. Uh, the students did not like that too much. Uh, all the students I talked to, I talked to one just today, um, and she's in uh, government here. She didn't like that, and her colleagues did not like that. And, uh, you know, there are other big bloated salaries here as well, as uh, Mr. Painter had already pointed out. So, yeah, we don't see that um, very fondly. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of a conversation back in 2015 with then-President Kaler, and we asked a lot of questions in the higher ed committee of him. Uh, and it was really an interesting dichotomy because either he would give you like the simplest uh, answer, whatever the money question was, or he would give you like, oh, well, we can show you our entire budget that's like this. So you have to like page through just volumes and volumes and volumes. So it, it really was never a happy medium. And so I, I really hope that whoever is the new president, and, and I, I'm very grateful that we have a very good regent in the room, um, that when we ask questions, you're either given an appropriate amount of information so you can digest it, you know, and not given this huge binder. But it's a real problem. And we, we understand that there is autonomy, but we still have the purse strings. And $1.4 billion is not nothing. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, this seems like I emphasize that this feel, feels so much like a bipartisan issue. This is not something where you have a Republican position or a Democrat position on this kind of thing at the legislature, because, you know, if you look at the analog in the, in the private corporate sector, I mean, we, we, we are always talking across both aisles about, you know, it's really it's kind of astronomical what kind of salary CEOs of private companies can get. Uh, at least those are born, you know, by their shareholders. But in this case, you're talking about astronomical salaries, big payouts uh, that are born entirely by students and the taxpayers of Minnesota. So it seems like a pretty bipartisan issue to deal with. I, I would think so. I, I've uh, sometimes said if I, if I were uh, deciding higher education policy, I'd let Bernie Sanders set the tuition and then let the Republicans figure out how to spend the money. <laughs> Uh, that, you know, and, and we used to have all, uh, you know, low cost public higher education in America, as I pointed out. We, we've just regressed. And uh, these massive salaries. I mean, why does a university president need to make one million? Oh, well, because in the Ivy League, they pay three or four million. Well, fine, go out there and, 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 and they're private and they're sitting there in tons of money and, and, and they have special centers for future presidents and the rest of it. We're not going to do that here. We're a public institution. But the amount of waste is astronomical. Uh, and I've dealt with a bureaucracy in this university, the so-called EEOAA, which is now has a different name. Uh, they took the affirmative action out of it. Uh, but, you know, massive bureaucracy, they don't do anything to protect students from sexual harassment by professors. That was another problem they had in the Humphrey School. Uh, but, you know, the EOAA, they just drag on and on. They don't investigate uh, uh, until the, you know, whenever, and they don't want to mess around with the tenured faculty, but they'll, you know, they open up a big investigation of a janitor at the EOA. Why was a janitor being investigated? Because at Appleby Hall, she told someone if she saw an intruder that she would call the police. Well, the, she didn't understand. She was reprimanded for this. The police were not welcome in Appleby Hall because the police are evil. And then the second thing is she apparently got her pronouns fouled up when she was cleaning people's potties at the night shift. And so they're investigating the janitor. I mean, that's the kind of thing that goes on. It, it, the bureaucrats are paid to do. But are they going to take on professors who sexually harass students? No. There's a dean here who has students in their graduate school exams, graduate students. Which famous scholars you want to shag, marry, or kill? And they won't do anything about that. But they'll go after the janitor. They'll go after students and say that the fraternity students are this, that, or the other thing. I don't even need to keep the frats under control. My son's just joined a frat. <laughs> but look, uh, the EOAA, massive bureaucracy, the football player case, the Eighth Circuit, uh, uh, knocked them on the ruck, knuckles, uh, really wrapped them on the knuckles over that. They had to go back to a federal district court. The university spent hundreds of thousands of dollars litigating that case. Uh, 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 is a sexual assault case involving football players, hundreds of thousands of dollars because EOAA couldn't get its act together. That's where your taxpayer money is going. 
And that's a bureaucracy we need to deal with in this place. And so on that note, uh, we've got, I think, time for one more topic, and then we can do some Q&A here. Um, but I do want to circle back before I jump to the last topic real quick on this, uh, because we talked about the most the, the, the feature issue here tonight has been about the anti-Semitic culture that's been created here on this campus. And we've talked briefly about a couple different candidates for uh, future president of this university. Any sense from you all, uh, at your what you've been able to ascertain at least, uh, as to whether these future presidents, uh, who are going to get paid a lot of money, I am sure, um, will take action to address this kind of uh, anti-Semitic culture we're seeing on campus? No. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I hope so. Um, <clears throat> but he here's the problem. When you allow something to go on for so long, it's really hard to stop it. And anti-Semitism has been a problem here since I don't know when, the 20s or 30s or, or whatever. So maybe 100 years. And no one's done anything about it, so it's just kind of, kind of quasi-acceptable. And along with other things like tuition increases or whatever. But I would just say that in general, my thinking about presidential candidates is we need someone from the outside. Now, Joan Gable, who you didn't want to name, <laughs> she, came, she came from the outside, and I was hopeful uh, that she was going to bring something from the outside. But the problem is, no matter where you come from, if you come from the inside, there are a lot of people who know your business because you've been here for a lot of years. So any income, you know, internal candidate that gets, that gets uh, surfaced has a lot of you know, things to answer for. A lot of people know their business and all that kind of stuff. And they also know a lot of things about the university. But the question is, can they do their jobs appropriately when they have this kind of ecosystem that they grew up in that's expecting him or her to act in a certain way going forward? Because there are a lot of people have a vested interest. You can see all the people who are you know, right now campaigning for Laura Bloomberg. She's internal, she's an internal candidate or that went away and now is, you know, maybe coming back. And then you have uh, two candidates from the outside. And I always favored the outside candidate because there was always just a little bit of hope that they're going to come in with something new, some new ideas, mm -hmm. some um, um, opportunity to kind of have people listen to them about kind of how they might have done things at another institution, and I think that's good for our institution. Yes, do you want to jump in there? I'm, I'm going to weigh in just really quick, because I, I actually uh, looked, I, I've done a little study about this. Um, well, first I would say that whoever the next president is, that um, my hope and my commitment to this room and to this institution is that I would and I'm sure my husband will say the same thing, Senator Rarick, who's also on the higher ed committee, will uh, reach out and actually have a much closer relationship. Um, I did not have any relationship with Joan Gable whatsoever. Uh, Kaler was uh, uh, not amenable to a uh, relationship with the legislature. Um, uh, Jeff Edinger has been better, I have to say. He has been, he has been better. What I would look for um, in a president is someone that actually isn't uh, isn't going to stay away from the legislature. I would like someone that would come and engage with us and talk with us. Um, you know, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. But relationship goes a really long way. And, uh, you know, with the individual candidates that we have, there's three. And to me, one uh, stands out. And, you know, she is... She's a doctor, uh, an ER doc, and so she has uh, nerves of steel, self-proclaimed. She says she has nerves of steel. <laughs> That's yet to be seen. She comes from a university, so Michigan State, or University of Michigan, I mean, and it's, it's at least comparable to this university. It's similar in size. Um, they have it, a better football team. They have a much better <laughs> football team. No. <laughs> <laughs> they have they have really great sports, um, but I feel like she's kind of. I think that she would do well here. I think that that is a, a, a like move across. Um, the other candidate comes from the uh, University of New Mexico. It's another very small school. 
um, they have a really high acceptance rate. And so that 96% of the people that apply to the University of New Mexico get in. And so conversely, they have a 35% graduation rate. Um, so that is challenging to say the least. I don't know that that is helpful for this university. It, it's not um, what we do here. But Michigan is closer to that, and, and I would say they're probably, they're a higher ranked university. I mean, that's very public. But they, they have a very low acceptance rate. It's like a 20% acceptance rate, but a 77% graduation rate there. So she comes, there, it's a different school, it's a different system, um, higher ranked. But I think, you know, she at least has been in the system long enough to know, in, in the Michigan system long enough to know that, you know, what worked there. Um, so I have some hope there. I just hope whoever it is that they actually reach out to the legislature and engage with us because that's been sorely lacking. Edinger has done better, but the previous ones that I've experienced have not been very helpful. You, Professor Penny, you, you look like you want to say well, I would just say that I think the candidates should all be asked that question, which apparently is very difficult for an Ivy League college president to answer. Uh, do you believe that calling for the genocide of the Jewish people violates your student code of conduct? If they can't figure that out, they can't figure out uh, a lot of things around here. They shouldn't get the job. So maybe we'll bring Elise Stefanik in to do the interviews, <laughs> or I don't know what the answer is. But, uh, you know, we got to have somebody with some brains who knows how to deal with the legislature uh, go to a hearing, maybe even the United States Congress. Yes, the subpoenas are going to start to fly, uh, not just at the Ivy League, uh, but the others. Uh, there's a problem that Congress is not going to let go of, of anti-Semitism in American campuses. Uh, anti-Semitism is said as a tragic history, and we cannot let it happen here. Uh, so we need a president who can handle these issues and stand up against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and the persecution of Christian students. I've seen many, many religious faiths persecuted on this campus by faculty and by administrators, and we cannot tolerate that. Well, thank you all. And let's go ahead and now we've, we're we coming up on an hour, so I want to make sure there's a little bit of time before everyone uh, totally loses feeling in their legs for some Q&A. So Luke, do you want to yeah, I'll, uh, I'll bring the microphone around, so I'll just hold it for you. I saw the first hand in the back, so we'll go back there, and then I'll be right up here. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Robert Eddy. I know several of you here, and I appreciate a lot of you, as well as a couple of gentlemen back here that I'm sitting with, uh, having followed what you've been doing for several years. But... Um, Representative Rarick, you'd be interested to know that on July 20, or excuse me, June 29th of last year, I had a meeting with Jeff Ettinger, mm -hmm. president here, just because he was meeting with various people that were donors and so forth, whatever. The first thing I had on my list was don't alienate your largest donors. I think the state of Minnesota could qualify as one of those. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to let you know that I said that to him. But I have two items here that I would like to hear some commentary about from many of you. Uh, the first one is, my opinion, having paid a lot of people in my career, is one of the best ways to keep costs down is to have incentive pay starting at the top and working its way down because people do what you pay them to do. And if you tell them that you want to cut costs down, that's what they'll do when you, when you pay them to do that. And the next thing is, when it gets to be too drastic as to what your problem is, uh, Professor Painter is an example of the anti-Semitism, uh, the websites, etc. the final solution on something like that is to terminate that individual. So I'd like to hear your comments on both those. I wanted to get a, a compensation plan in place that, you know, had some things in there that, you know, could actually be uh, be counted as, you know, uh, you know, a way to get the president to actually do something in certain areas and uh, basically was told, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and 
I was I was very disappointed. And then when the president showed up, I said, hey, how about if we have some incentives uh, for you? Uh, and she goes, yeah, that'd be great. Put them on top of what you're giving me. <laughs> and to me, that was kind of like, OK, that that conversation's over. That's a non-starter. <laughs> yeah, we need to be able to terminate some people. And uh, professors have tenure. Uh, I've got tenure. So they can't fire me for, for example, being here tonight and talking about how they waste all the money. <laughs> uh, but an administrator does not have tenure, and a president of the university does not have tenure. Neither does uh, does a dean. And uh, you know those websites. That was the responsibility of the dean of the College of Liberal Arts. They have an interim dean because the dean John Coleman went on down to Illinois to be the provost, where they had more websites until somebody had to shut that down. Uh, but the interim dean, I asked her over and over again you got to get those websites down. It'd be so easy to get those websites down. You don't need to discipline the faculty members. That's not what we're asking for. Just get it off the website. And the College of Liberal Arts Dean could have done that, you know, easily. And she wouldn't answer the emails at all. And don't believe this when they say it's free speech, because there isn't free speech for a lot of people here. Uh, free of a uh, fire. Uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education has written this university about breaches of freedom of speech by, indeed, the same College of Liberal Arts dean. So, you know, they don't give everybody free speech. They, it's the same thing that came up in the hearing in Washington, D.C., where the president of the University of Pennsylvania was confronted by a member of Congress who said, well, you know, M President McGill, fact is that Penn punishes speech it doesn't like. And that's the same way they run the College of Liberal Arts here. Uh, th there are some deans who need to be fired. Uh, so this is what's going on here. It's the administrators uh, won't do anything about these problems. They just simply ignore those of us who complain. So yes, we need to go to the Department of Education. Now, I don't know what the Department of Education will do because I, the cynical side of me makes me think they're just going to kick the can down the road to November. So they'll look good. And by the way, they dropped the investigation of the University of Pennsylvania. Why? Because somebody sued. And they said that's a reason to drop. Nonsense. They dropped the investigation of the University of Pennsylvania, I think, because they're covering up for some people in Washington, D.C. I won't say who. Um, but bottom line is that I think that, unfortunately, the Department of Education, I'm hoping it won't be this way, but it could just be a repeat of dealing with the EOAA here at the University of Minnesota. But that's about how Washington is dysfunctional, and that's the rest of where our taxpayer money goes. Just really quickly. So um, I see this as something that the Regent Board should be taking a greater role doing. Um, if people are, and I, I know I'm looking right at our, our Regent back there, but uh, this is something that the legislature, we can't dictate, we, we can't do. So the, Breed of, the Board of Regents is like your legislature here at this university. And if there's something that's gone sideways, you know, I will say this, though. So what's concerning to me and why I push so hard for this gentleman to be a regent is that there is a tendency on the regent board to just vote yes for whatever the administration wants. And we have been fighting that in just this endemic issue for as long as I've been there, 12 years and probably much longer. It has just been, they were long seen as just this rubber stamp. So when the administration is really running the university and not the Board of Regents, this is what you get. You get uh, people that probably should have been fired and let go. You don't have performance-based pay. You've got all of these things because the administration doesn't want that. So if you want change, you've got, we, the legislature, have to elect boards or regents through the board like this gentleman and like uh, Farnsworth back there, Regent Farnsworth, and others, the Rosha before him, um, that actually stand up, ask questions, push back, and don't just go, okay, got it. There's a $1.2 million salary, out you go. And really, that's where the power is, is in the Regent boards, but they kind of abdicate their power to the administration. And that's a really sad thing. And that's why we have bloat. That's why we have what we have right now. And anti-Semitism, honestly. Thank you, thank you, and, and I really appreciated uh, the clarity and the uh, uh, common sense that I heard tonight. Uh, my name is Bruno Sharat, and I'm a faculty here. 
uh, questions for the representative. Uh, I was wondering if uh, there is any kind of bipartisan uh, discussion regarding those statements or the 26 people who signed this letter, which I've seen, are they all on one side uh, of, the, of the political spectrum or is there any kind of conversation with the Demo Democrats as well? You know, that is an excellent question. And, and thank you for being a professor here. And I'm just... And I, are you, are you Jewish? Yeah. French. French. Okay, French Jewish. Okay. I apologize for even asking in a public forum, but I, I just had a sense that possibly. Um, so unfortunately, the letter that I sent out was all on the Republican side, but I will say this. There are many Jewish people in the legislature on the other side of the aisle. It, you may have seen uh, Senator Latz, who did, no, so Senator Latz did an entire press conference and um, and spoke very plainly. So he is a uh, he's a lawyer. Uh, he's also uh, uh, been in the legislature a very long time, and he happens to be the chair of the Judici Judiciary Committee. So it's a very powerful, very big committee in the Senate. And he did a press conference, and he laid out exactly what had happened on October seventh in very specific detail, and denounced it. He is Jewish as well. Um, there are other Jewish members of the Senate. There are Jewish members of the House. Um, he is the most prominent person that I know that has spoken out in like, in, in fact, he spoke out much more strongly than, than we did. Um, he has put things out on X, on Facebook. He has been very, very public. Um, so I would definitely not take that this is only Republicans because there definitely are very loud voices on the other side of the aisle uh, and he has taken heat for those comments, um, but every single thing that he said has been proven to be accurate and true. See, the Bruno is one of the professors here who stood up for our Jewish students, and of course they try to silence him, uh, but Bruno, you're not going to be silenced. Uh, one of the others they want to silence is my wife, Karen Painter, who's not Jewish. She's attended the music school, and they try to hush her up, but there's no way they're going to get away with that. Uh, so uh, there's some people who are standing up to the craziness uh, at this place, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, I've talked about this with Ken Martin, the chair of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. I'm a political independent, uh, and I had a good talk with him, and he sort of says this is a very serious problem we have here at the university uh, with anti-Semitism, agree with everything that I had to say about this, and then uh, the question is what's going to get done about it. At the end of the day, when we elect people to public office, and we have a chairman of our parties, it's not just what do we say, what are we going to do? And uh, I'm going to call upon both political parties to step to the plate here. Unfortunately, I, I know part of what's going on in the DFL. There is a big primary fight coming up here in the 5th Congressional District in the DFL primary. We know there's money coming in on both sides. Uh, I think there's some money from Qatar probably getting in there, too. And uh, they've already lined up the unions, our clerical workers union, is uh, they have a new president of the Clerical Workers Union who is openly pro-Hamas. And uh, so they've taken over that union, the Minneapolis Teachers Union. And the key to unions in Democratic primaries, you got to get them out to vote. And having the unions is really important. I hope the Teamsters Union doesn't go Hamas. Uh, but uh, this is uh, th what's going on here is against the backdrop of uh, politics in an election year very hotly contested, about four U.S. House primaries around the country. They're hotly contested on the Democratic side over the anti-Semitism anti issue, and Minnesota's 5th Congressional District is one of them. So unfortunately, we're a little bit, uh, I think we're getting played here by powers that are uh, well beyond us. Um, and maybe that'll go away after the election. Uh, but the anti-Semitism will not go away unless we stand up to it. It's going to be here to stay. And it's dangerous. I was going to say, I heard Karen has a good lawyer. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I need backup, I get backup, too. Awesome. Well, I think we have one more. We have time for one more very quick question. If there's one right back here. Sounds good. I'll try to just wrap it up very soon after. So um, gee whiz, cultural studies and American Indian studies are all on CLI, which is both sad, like it's been said vaguely, but just to make that explicit. Um, so, state support is slightly larger than t total Twin Cities tuition. Um, 
the way the university, so the university's budget model is kind of radically decentralized. According to the university, state support goes directly to the colleges rather than passing through any sort of central financial apparatus. So according, according to the university, according to the finance operations of the university, state support goes directly to the colleges within the university's accounting system. Therefore, you actually have the power to defund CLA very easily. The, you know, medical school and CFANS, I know, get special allocations. Mm -hmm. Special allocations. Yes. You can just do away with general state support, and the state legislature, at any point that they would like, can allocate state support on a college by college basis every budget cycle. So my question would be, why not do that? Or you could very easily, you know, you could do that presumably mid-cycle. I mean, we won't have a budget cycle until, like the budget bill will be next year, bonding mm -hmm. is this year. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I would think you could probably finagle something if you wanted to alter the university's allocation in this way. You wouldn't be changing any of the dollars. You'd just be directing them to specifically to individual colleges. You could very easily leverage and whack CLA and make Ann Walter dance however you like. Or at the very least, make her come and talk to you. So my question was just, why not do that? It's interesting that you bring that up uh, because in the back of the room is my senator, is my husband and Senator Rarick who uh, used the power of the purse when he wanted to make a statement uh, about athletics. And so we have tried that. Um, I am more than willing to put forth a bill to try to do that, to make a statement whether or not the university would actually abide by it is another question. Um, it, it, you raise an interesting point. It, it is not something that, I mean, it is something that we have talked about before on a small scale, but not for like an entire, you know, like CLA, right? So, um, like- CLA it, don't defend me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, see and, that, and, that, and there lies the problem. I'm like- Let me just right, speak right, out right, for the yeah. liberal arts. I mean, I'm, I was a history major in college, but if, you know, if we don't teach history, we forget, that's why we should remember not just the Holocaust, but the persecution of the Jews over 2,000 years. And these people talk about subtle colonial. I mean, does anyone know why we have the diaspora? I mean, does anyone study history anymore? Uh, no, it's all a bunch of theory. The problem, we don't need to get rid of CLA. It's the critical theory, the post-colonial theory, the nut jobs uh, that we have led into academia, not just in, United, in, in Minnesota, but in, in many universities around the country. We, people need to learn history and the study of literature, the study of philosophy. There's so much value there in the liberal arts. To have to throw away the liberal arts and to shut down the College of Liberal Arts because uh, it's being taken over by ideologues with crazy theories, that would be a real tragedy. Sack and Walter, she's been a disaster over there. And Coleman was a disaster before, which is why they brought him down to Illinois to be provost, because they wanted a weak provost. Uh, he can't get it, do anything done, get anything done, so he's down there at Illinois. Bottom line is, it's the administrators who mess things up, and some of the faculty with the extremist ideas. Uh, and, and it is anti-Semitism. Bruno wrote a book about, was well, his theory good for the Jews? Well, that was several years ago. Critical theory, post-colonial theory, we know what that means for the Jews. Annihilation. And we need, we need a liberal arts college, but we need people in the liberal arts who will stand up for the truth. Can I just answer the, the previous question? The problem with the University of Minnesota is the autonomy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the legislature sends over a check for 1.4, let's say $700 million a year, and then the university decides how it's divvied up. Mm -hmm. So if you say we're going to not fund CLA, and you know what the CLA budget was last year, and you're going to cut it, then the university will just say, oh, well, we're going to cut everybody then, and we're going to equalize things out and protect CLA. So that's generally what they do. And what they'll do when it comes down to, like, maybe um, uh, tuition, mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, if the legislature doesn't give money, we'll just increase tuition. And that's why you see <laughs> tuition sky high, because they use it as an excuse. They say, well, the legislature didn't give, it us, give us enough money, so we're going to increase tuition now. And the thing people don't understand about increasing tuition 
is it never goes down. The best you can do is freeze it. I think if you go on the website, they claim to have reduced uh, tuition by like half a percent back when they made the switch from the quarter system to the semester system. I'm not sure exactly how that worked, but uh, there is no way the tuition is ever going to go down unless there's something done at a federal level or something because the university depends on that tuition dollar. Each year when they increase tuition, they that's what the, the big fight is over the whatever it is, $30 million of increase every year. And they fight to they fight to get that money from whatever. Uh, usually they come to the Board of Regents with um, a sob story about why tuition has to go up. And then seven regents vote for it and it's done. In fact, I'll just tell you, I came to school. I was I was raised in Ames, Iowa, another good school there. I came to school up here. And by the time, uh, between the time that I accepted my admissions in May or whatever, and when I showed up on campus, tuition, out-of-state tuition went up 25%. Okay, that is the largest increase ever of tuition, either resident or non-resident tuition, in the history of the University of Minnesota. And a lot of people don't realize it, but when you accept your admissions here, you don't really know what the tuition is going to be until you show up in the fall. So that that's all kind of one of the th idiosyncrasies of the University of Minnesota in that the autonomy is a big factor. And the first thing you're taught as a regent on day one is we're autonomous. Forget about everything everybody told you when you were getting trying to get elected. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is that's the absolute reality. Uh, and. You, you said it very, very succinctly, um, you know, and I, I point back to my husband who did try, you know, to do a really small amount of money, just really small to try to save some of uh, the sports programs here. But uh, it is very, very difficult. It's not been successful. Uh, I don't know that in all of the history we've been able to dictate to that level, but we do have, I mean, there are some things that we fund like research things. There's $100 million worth of line items specific to research, but um, they would do exactly what he just said. In my 12 years at the legislature, I'm sure that's exactly what they would do. I want to say, you, when Joan Gable was give, getting herself that great big pay raise uh, from the vote for the Board of Regents as part of the back scratching that I was talking about, only two members of the legislature were there sitting in the audience to express concern, uh, and that was Jason and Marion uh, Rarick. Uh, and the Teamsters were there, too, because they weren't getting a living wage. They were getting squeezed, and she's giving herself a pay raise. Uh, but we need more members of the legislature attending these board of uh, regents meetings and holding the regents accountable. We need more members of the legislature, like Jason and Mary, uh, who care about the taxpayers and care about the students of this university. The students are suffering. They're graduating with massive debt uh, to pay for what? Uh, and uh, we're debt financing higher education in the United States. Uh, and then the idea is you're supposed to vote for a president who will just forgive it all and shove it over to the taxpayer. The Supreme Court will let him do it. Uh, but, you know, this is just, uh, it's going on and on. And uh, we need somebody to stand up to it. So thank you, Jason and uh, Marion. Thank you for, for standing up for our students. All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been a fantastic, wide-ranging discussion. And um, I think we can give them all a hand for And then one last closing remark, if your envelope is still empty. <laughs> no. But um, yeah, there is a bowl in the back there. If you did decide to make a donation tonight, if you could just drop the envelope in there, that would be awesome. And then there are, in the very back left uh, of the room here, um, there are some cookies. So shout out T-Rex Cookie. The owner is actually right here. She's also my mom. Um, so there are free cookies for you guys. Um, so on your way out, please grab one of those. They are fantastic. But other than that, thank you so much for coming.